there you can go. Perfect. So yeah, so as has been outlined and as on the screen, so I chose to do my um, my undergraduate research, my thesis or my FYP on women of Irish history. So as Grani, you've already read it out for me, but it is essentially the title of my project is an evaluation and analysis of the double marginality of 20th century Republican Irish women. So that's quite a mouthful. There's it's it's a lot to take in on first viewing, but I'll break that down and go through it now. Um, but essentially my research, it stemmed from, oh, sorry, the slideshow isn't moving for me here now. So there we go. So sorry about that. But my research, it stemmed from a passion for Irish history. And it was uh, last summer, one, one evening, I was watching an Irish documentary about Irish history, and it was coming from a perspective of women. And I thought it was a very interesting perspective because it's one that's not commonly taken. And it, caught, it made me sort of have a sit down with myself. And I questioned myself, I love Irish history, but I actually don't know an awful lot about the women of Irish history. And it got me thinking about how many famous Republican women I could think of, um, which of course that stems then so to where I was, um, where the title came from. So just to go through the title of the project, obviously as researchers, we all, I think it's fairly self-explanatory evaluation and analysis. But for the 20th century, so for the, pre the period of time in question, it focuses on the 1900s. And I think that's just some important to point out because I know often people confuse the century with the years in question. It's always the years before when you're referring to a century. So I'll be focusing on the 1916 Easter Rising, the War of Independence, the Civil War, and right through to the conflict of Northern Ireland, which is also known as the Troubles. Then the term double marginality. Double obviously infers to the fact that not only have they been marginalised once, but they have in fact been marginalised again twice still today. So that's where the term double comes into play. And the term marginality then stems from the word marginalisation. So again, big word, but it's when you break it down, it becomes clear in your head what everything means. And marginalisation, as I'm sure many of you know, essentially means to be put, to undervalue the importance of someone or something to put them in the sidelines or in the margins of society. So to, to say that someone is marginalised is inferring that they are less important than someone else or something else. So the first question then is, when talking about these women of Irish history, and for me to throw out a big statement to say that they're forgotten about or they're marginalised, we have to question, well, were they? So obviously off the bat, I presume that they are because I myself couldn't think of any. But then when I actually started going through literature and past publications and journal articles, I did start noticing some key words and key buzz words that did infer that yes, they were. Um, so I have these on the screen. They were Republican Irish women throughout the 20th century were referred to as unseen, forgotten. They were slave women. History refers to them as being overlooked. People have come forward and questioned, well, what did the women do? And people have inferred to them as being written out of history, which I think that last quote is very significant because it also proves that of the little research that is done on women, this research itself says that they have been written out of history. So just um, amongst yourselves as well, because it's it's great to contextualise things in our own heads to be clear of them. I, um, I think it's interesting, although research will tell us, yes, these women have been marginalised, it's also effective when you try and, you know, do a little test in your own heads. And I don't know how many of you are interested in Irish history or know much about it, but if you try and think of as many Irish women from this period of time, the 20th century, as you can, I presume if you're anything like myself, you'll be able to count them all on one hand, if at all, and um, the list would not be that long. So it's an interesting little task I put to you to just take a moment to think, think about that and try and think of different women and what their roles may have included. And then similarly and contrastingly, to do the same for men. And I'm sure, um, according to my own opinion and according to the research that I've done, the list that you will gather of men, Republican, Republican Irish men, will be far greater than that of the women. And it is because we do tend to know more about Irish men. History is looked upon as the men's war, men won Irish his won freedom for Ireland. Everything is very focused on the brave, heroic Irish men. Very seldom do we reference the women. And Again, we can question why, and that, that's a whole different kind of branch of research in itself. But um, personally, I think that the, the church have a lot to answer for. I think, obviously, when we gained independence from British control in 1922, the Catholic Church had a, had a major influence of the country and how it was run. 
And naturally, the ideal woman, according to the church, was a homemaker. She cooked, she cleaned, she reared the family. Her main role in life was to procreate. And I think that that has a lot to answer for as to why history wrote these women out of history, the history books, and why we don't know as much about them. But again, that's, that's just one, one kind of answer to the question. There's many other approaches you could take, which in itself is potential for future research. So then when you acknowledge that these women, that we know less about women, you have to question, is it because they're not, that they don't exist? Is it because they weren't active in Ireland's revolutions? Or on the other hand, is it because their existence is little remembered? Is it because, well, they did have a role in Ireland's past, but history fails to remember this. So obviously then point A of this research project, I began with first getting clear in my own head, well, what did these women do? Um, and that's when I came across the Women's Association Common Amon, um, which is just representative of, of many different groups of women and individuals who were active in Ireland's past. But in particular, Common Amon, they, they, were, they had a, a huge significance in Irish history. Um, and the work of Common Amon, they included many different roles. Obviously, many of them were the unglamorous tasks that we all know, which I've just mentioned, cooking, cleaning, rearing families. But also they had a much more active role on the battlefield that that people tend to not read to not realize and you'll see there in the bottom corner of the screen i've got the badge or the logo so to speak that come in them on war um, as part of their uniform and on this logo you've got the letters the abbreviated come in them on mounted upon a rifle the significance of the rifle is that it shows that women too as well as men were not afraid of being in the heart of the war they were on the battlefield they too used armed weapons. It was not just the men who did this. And the rifle represents that. It represents their active active roles um, within these Republican groups. Um, for instance, during Easter week of 1916, it was reported to there was at least 40 women inside the GPO at any given time. But yet we only tend, history tends to only kind of focus on the men that were there and the seven signatories, Porrick Pierce, and these, these main famous na buzz names that pop into our minds. Um, additionally to actually being part of the, the war and on the battlefield, women fundraised for IRA volunteers. They provided safe houses and a safe house was essentially a house that a man or IRA man who would have been on the run from British forces, British troops could have could have taken refuge in these houses and the women of the house would have looked after them and made sure that they got them on their journey again safe. Additionally, if we talk later into the latter half of the 20th century during the troubles or the conflict of Northern Ireland, women went where had Armagh jail was a women's jail. It exist, it coexisted alongside the very famous Long Kesh. And whilst everyone knows of the famous Bobby Sands and his and the 10 hunger strikers who went on hunger strike for their rights during the during the troubles, people fail to remember or not that they fail to remember. I don't think they actually realize that this also happened for women. Um, and three women actually went on hunger strike during Armagh jail during the same time as the men. Um, so I just think it's significant that people don't realise this. And the problem lies with that history is failing to remember this. So it's something that we have to look at and consider to reevaluate and redress this imbalance um, between the genders and rewrite them back into the history books. Just very briefly, and I won't I won't focus too much on this slide, but I did want to include a picture of proof of this instead of just saying that, yeah, women have been marginalized. I also wanted to kind of present um, actual footage of it um, in the flesh so that you could see for yourselves that this did happen. So the picture I've got on screen, it is a picture that was actually published in a newspaper during the 1916 Easter Rising. In the first, in the very first um, picture to the, to the left of the screen, it shows Park Pierce surrendering to British to the British Army just outside the GPO. And just below Park Pierce's coat, his trench coat, you'll actually see a second pair of legs in beside him. And there, those are the legs of a lady called Elizabeth O'Farrell. Now, Elizabeth O'Farrell would have been like Park Pierce's PA. She was his secretary. And she stayed with Park Pierce in the GPO for the entire week. Um, and she carried out as significant roles as any of the men in the GPO on those days. But you'll see as the picture moves towards the right of the screen, those legs disappear. And the, this is because this was almost like a form of propaganda. The woman was actually removed from the image. So the picture that actually made it to the press that everyone in the public seen, the woman wasn't in the picture. So she was, this is, this is in itself just proof 
to recap everything I've just said, that women were written out of history. She was removed from the picture because they didn't probably want to have a woman portrayed in this way. So that's kind of where all of my, that summarizes the research that yes, women were marginalized in the 20th century. So then I have tied in this new concept that I came up with myself, which is the term double marginality. And the, the purpose of the fact that, that they have been doubly marginalized is because uh. I just say you have one minute left. Perfect. Thank you, Grania. Yeah. So just that not yeah. only were they marginalized throughout the 20th century, but that they continue to be marginalized still today in the 21st century, insofar as in the way history is recalled. So I used um, print media, so namely your traditional newspaper, uh, as a method to study the past and new media, namely Spotify uh, music, to measure the, the extent of knowledge that exists in the present day in the 21st century. So I used Spotify, which is the world's leading uh, streaming platform, and I used a playlist, which is the um, top search result playlist for Republican music. So naturally, a novice to Irish Republican music would find themselves listening to this playlist. Um, and I'm just going to try and re fly through these results really quickly because at the time, of course, sorry, but um, of these 91 songs that were on the playlist, I found that 80.2% of these songs were male focused. So these worship the brave, heroic Irish men and only 2.2% worship females. So that in itself kind of shows that unknowingly today we are still marginalizing these women, but we don't even realize we're doing it because of the songs that we are listening to. Now of these songs, when you look at the stream count, the male streams were streamed over 50 million times to that of the females. Again, that's massive. So naturally we're going to presume that it was a men's war and that women weren't as involved. And then when you do focus on the six in a, the almost six and a half million female songs that were streamed, it's interesting to note that over six million of these belong are as a result of the very famous song Grace, which I'm sure you all know the song Grace. Um, and that song actually commodifies women. Everyone thinks it's about an Irish Republican woman called Grace, but it is in fact about Grace's husband, who she married prior to his execution in 1916. And she's commodified as his, as his lover as opposed to as an active Republican warrior herself. So just to tie it up and in the last 30 seconds, I, I'll just say if the reason this has such a significance to it is because obviously we all know the famous saying, you can't be what you can't see. And if we can't learn and actually realize what Irish Republican women did and what their roles and what, what was involved in their everyday lives during the 20th century, so the women of yesterday, it's very hard for the women of today to reflect and to, to take inspiration or motivation from that. And you can question, well, are we evolving because, you know, gender stereotypes are slowly starting to fade, but current trends do suggest that the past does still mirror the present. And when I looked at the three main kind of categories that I could pick out for health, economics and politics, all statistics point to the fact that, yes, women are still marginalised. So. I'll finish on this slide here, but just to the, the statistics that exist is that over 90% of the nurses in the HSE today are female. 84.4% um, of health and social care professionals are female and nursing is just not deemed, just not deemed a great job, a job among men. Uh, similarly, in economics, the females accounted for only 34.4% of managerial positions in comparison to 65.6%. So again, there's, there's a staggering difference between the two genders. And in politics of the current Dáil Éireann, women make up only 22.5% of our government in comparison to 77.5% males. So again, it's huge. Um, and if we don't address this, the past and their, their marginalisation in the past, it's very hard to move forward in the future and gain true gender equality between the two for us to learn from that. So I'll finish on the quote from Dr Mary McAleaf um, from the University of Dublin who said that we owe these women their histories back. We owe these women to lift the veil of silence that has lain upon their experiences. And we owe these women a rewriting back into the history books. And she said this referring to the fact that we need to address the past before we can look to the future. Because if we do not know who we were, history is not the story of strangers. It is the story of us had we been born a little earlier. So that is all. And thank you very much. I know I went slightly over time, but if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to, to assist. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. I'm just going to stop the recording.